Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. In this episode, we pick up of our story on the Canton Bulldogs professional football team in 1906. We are in part two of this story left off. It would be a roller coaster ride for the Bulldogs and professional football as well in the coming decade or so. And the story's coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day to day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we've taken a little bit of a break. We had a little bit of vacations and some things going on here this summer. But we are back into our story of the Canton Bulldogs professional football team. And uh, you know, we've covered parts one and part two. And as we learned in part two of this series on the Canton Bulldogs, uh, the scandal and accusations of underhanded dealings by Captain Blondie Wallace and others of the Canton team left the squad in ruins. Their rival, the Maslin Tigers, were feeling the after effects of public embarrassment as well from their embroilment in the press of the alleged allegations against them. It was all a matter of did Wallace attempt to even succeed in a plot to pay off the Maslin players or to throw the game? Certainly the Tigers star Bob Shiring and Tiny Maxwell described the incident to authorities that they had been approached by Canton operatives to do as such and readily declined and then reported it. Our friend Greg Fasseri in his book who's titled Gridiron Legacy Pro Football's Missing Origin Story that will be out soon uh, has the story and all the details to describe this uh, tale in a little bit more detail as far, far as uh, Shiring and Tiny Maxwell. We'll leave that to him to tell that story. But the first sign of public opinion was the final scheduled game of the season for Canton against Latrobe, one that had been scheduled preseason, and one that Wallace and manager George Williams of Canton planned on being a real moneymaker to put the club into a profitable light at season's end. The PFRA's Coffin Corner publication article titled The Ohio Tiger Trap says that, quote, A crowd of 6,000 had been hoped for, but only a loyal 939 actually came to the park. The Bulldogs couldn't even cover the expenses of that, much less pay their players. Williams and Wallace blamed the scandal for the small crowd, but that was probably not the whole reason. Once the team lost to Maslin, most casual fans just lost interest, end quote. The loss of profit was devastating to the Bulldog organization. Players cannot be paid for their services they perform. Some were trapped with no way to get home to their their home cities. Uh, The article from the PFRA states that even if the scandal had not broken, that the pro football in 1906 was doomed. Because these super teams like Maslin and Canton have been built, they were the only competitive and interesting squads around. No one wanted to watch either of them dismantle the lesser competitive teams they played. And the only competition was playing each other, and that matchup would quickly lose its luster. The 1906 scandal propelled the inevitable, the collapse of professional football, at least as it had been operating in the last few years. Now, Wallace's reputation was so badly damaged that he could never again be in the limelight of football. His libel suit never made it to trial, but public opinion on what he was accused of was just too damaging to his reputation. As for professional football in Canton, Ohio, well, there would be none for years in the aftermath. Maslin, too, would suffer. One note to mention is that during the 1906 season, on October 25th, one of the Maslin players, uh, Peggy Perrot, tossed what had been deemed as the first professionally thrown 
forward pass in the game's history. But back to Parat in just a moment. The bug of pro football in Stark County was still alive. The people there missed the game and its excitement, as well as the rivalries with Maslin and Akron. That led to a revival some five odd years later in 1911, where Canton finally fielded a team, a new team, that they called the Canton Professionals. The team was made up of entirely local players, and the pay was undoubtedly very small. In their comeback season, the pros finished in second place in the standings behind Peggy Perrott and his new team, the Shelby Blues. The Canton 11 were slowly evolving and getting better each of the coming years, until in 1914, they were strong enough to challenge Perrott and his new squad in Akron for the Ohio State title. The leader in the, of the professionals was a player named Harry Turner. Now, Canton defeated Perrott's new team, the Akron Indians, squad in their initial regular season meeting of the clubs. However, in the victory, they suffered what would be a devastating and tragic blow. The Canton squad's captain, Harry Turner, was so severely injured during the game while attempting to tackle Akron's Joe Collins. The pro's on-field leader later died of a fracture to his spinal cord. According to Canton general manager Jack Kuzak, who was at Turner's bedside when he died, his last words were, quote, I know I must go, but I'm satisfied for we beat Peggy Perrot." end quote. Canton won the initial game with Shelby 6 to nothing. However, that tragic death of Turner was taken hard by the team. It was the first fatal accident involving a major professional football team in Ohio. The professionals easily lost the rematch to the Indians a few days later, and the passing of Turner looked like another death knell for the Canton's pro football program. Kusak, though, would do everything in his power to prevent the collapse of Canton football. In 1915, Jack made some changes. He robbed some of the top players from Akron and hired Olympic hero and former Carlisle Indian gridiron star Jim Thorpe for the sum of $250 per game. He also restored the traditional name of the Bulldogs as the moniker of the team. Maslin also revived their pro football team as the Tigers, and in 1915, the old rivals scheduled two games against each other. In the first meeting, Thorpe did not play, and the Tigers won handily 16 to nothing. In game two a few weeks later, Thorpe did play, and he dominated the game, providing all of the scoring in a 6 to nothing Bulldog victory. His talent, reputation, and experience were just what the Dogs needed, and they soon named him as their captain and coach. The best thing that was for he put butts in the bleachers. But Jack Cusack had apparently done the impossible and revived the Canton Bulldogs team. In 1916, the Bulldogs went undefeated and smoked Maslin 24 to nothing in the process. Then he recognized Canton as not only the best team in Ohio, but as the top professional gridiron squad in the nation. In 1917 was more of the same. The Bulldogs jumped out strong right from the, out of the chute, winning their first eight games to claim the mythical Ohio League title. Neither Canton or Maslin fielded teams or played at all during the 1918 season because of World War I, of course, and the dreaded Spanish flu pandemic. Jack Kuzak left the team that year to pursue riches in starting up an oil business in Oklahoma. In his place stepped a local businessman, Ralph Hay, a successful auto dealer, who took over managing and owning the team. And that's where we're going to leave off in this segment of the Bulldog story. So look back here soon for more on Canton's football tale. And we hope you enjoyed this little bit of football history. Hope you enjoy us each and every day. We have something new coming out on Pixie and Dispatch. It's not always a podcast, though. It may be a video clip. Uh, it may be just a post on our website, pixiedispatch.com. And, of course, we try to three or four times a week put some new podcasts out there for you as well. But don't worry, if you like the podcast, go to pigskindispatch.com. Every single day, there is a podcast that is reviving the history of that particular day. You can find it as a new post on Pigskin Dispatch daily. So, till tomorrow, everybody, have a great gridiron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. 
we invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Sports History Network.